lie in the shadows Waiting for the light Talking story around kitchen table It is such an honor to talk to Nobuko Miyamoto and the word is we will be blessed with her performing her music for us live from her just released album 120,000 Stories. Hello Nobuko. Hello Daiji. How are you? <laughs> Very good, thank you. It is, it, I, I can't, oh, I'm so excited about this. For those who don't know Nobuko, she has spent her life as a performer. She studied dance as a child and went on to perform the film version of King and I, stage performances, the flower drum song and West Side Story. She even acted in a television series there, but there was some point in her life that changed to activism. I am so curious about this. Nobuko, can you talk about this activist direction? Was there something that inspired or triggered this in your life's journey and takes, takes you to the, the, today to your newest album, 120,000 Stories? Well, <clears throat> and being a performer is you're sort of part of this media business that projects Asians in a very limited fashion. And even though I was trained as a dancer, you know, I reached a sort of limit of what I could do. So I started searching and looking for other ways to express myself. And at the same time, this was the 60s. <laughs> and the Vietnam War was going on and young people all over the country, of course, were rising up. Um, I was politically totally green, uh, but I met an Italian filmmaker, Antonello Branca, who was making a film about uh, the Black Panthers. It was a documentary drama. And um, I helped just, you know, I was like go a gopher in a way. And I, I helped doing this film. I met the Panthers uh, in Los Angeles and in New York and discovered that a lot of the things that they were talking about, uh, self-determination, um, understanding racism, where racism was coming from within the system and how it was uh, perpetuated and syst systematic, applied to me too. It wasn't just uh, for black people. And <clears throat> we were in New York uh, filming uh, something at this church, at a Latino church, called the Young Lords Church because the Young Lords were sort of the, the uh, Puerto Rican version of the Black Panthers. And they were trying to use this church for a breakfast for children's program. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the church kept turning them down and turning them down, they sort of took over, they occupied the church. And we were there during this occupation uh, where families and children and, and uh, political activists were in this, crowded in this church for a weeks at a time. And there I met a Japanese American woman, her name was Yuri Kojiyama. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Yuri, uh, she was the one who brought me into the Asian American movement. Uh, she invited me to a meeting of Asian Americans for Action in New York City. And there I met not only young activists, but Niseis, people that looked like my mother and my aunties, who were active, who were uh, radical. <laughs> and, uh, and so we as a group uh, of younger uh, Sanseis and elders uh, were protesting against the war, doing uh, all kinds of planning, uh, trying to get the JACL to make a stand against the Vietnam War. Mm. And I really had dropped all my personal ambitions at that time. Mm. I, I said, this is it. I'm, this is the answer, not only to my problems, but to everybody's problem. And, and uh, Warren Furadani came to Asian Americans for Action and said, come to Chicago and let's speak to the JACL, <clears throat> make them to take a stand against the war. So activists from the West Coast and the East Coast came together for the very first time. Wow. It was amazing to see that 
not only in New York was organizing going on in communities, but in the West Coast, of course, which was so much bigger, um, we were learning, you know, they were uh, for drug programs, elder programs, uh, housing programs, health programs, all kinds of things that people were doing for the serve the people mm. programs that they were doing for the community. And that day, uh, which was a revolution and revelation in itself, just to meet our brothers and sisters and to realize, oh my God, we're a movement. This is bigger than what we even ever imagined. Then uh, some of us went to meet the Black Panthers and they greeted us as brothers and sisters. We were walking back and we bumped into a Native American group who was fighting for housing for Native people and urban Indians. And we were like, <laughs> sort of vibrating with this whole idea of, my God, we are part of this much greater thing that, than we could have imagined. And we went back to the church where we were sleeping on the floor in the sleeping bags. And Chris, at the, Chris Ijima, who was from New York, brought out his guitar and was just sort of playing around with his guitar, just trying to relax. And he started grooving on something that Fred Hampton the Chicago Panther who had just been murdered, he used to say the people's beat. Listen to the people's beat. And so Chris started on this and suddenly he got into a groove and had a chorus and I just started singing with him and it felt good. And sort of on the spot, we wrote a song. Aww. And the next day <laughs> at the JHCL convention in 1970, mm -hmm. we performed this song for the elders of JCCL and also the younger people, the activists. Wow, the next day you're saying it. And we realized, oh my God, this is the song we never had. Oh, oh this is so touching and, and inspiration to hear. Oh my gosh, that, that I hope more people hear your story and you know what, um, the, especially the young people today to give them power and, and realize, wow, what, what already went on and what they need to follow with, right? Yeah, so, so at the very beginning of the movement, you know, there's now this whole talk about, you know, standing up for black lives and all this. We had always done that. Right. It was right, it was embedded in the movement right from the beginning. Right. And we had a sense that we were part of people of color, that, that we had more power mm. to stand on when we, we're joining other people of color. Mm -hmm. So we actually, a tragedy happened when we were in Chicago, a young girl, 16 years old from Modesto, I believe, Stockton, California, was murdered in her in the hotel room. And somebody slit her throat. Oh, no. And another sister, uh, Ronko Yamada went up and found her. That was her roommate. She also had her throat slit. Oh. Ronko lived, but Evelyn passed away. And that murder was, here we were in Chicago, and we felt like it was a threat against us. It wasn't just a random thing that happened. And Chris and I decided we, first of all, we understood the power of music we wanted to do something to support the people and to find out what was going on on the West Coast. So we went back to New York and we wrote about five or six songs. We, we, we uh, learned some Beatles songs together and some Dylan songs. And we did our first concert at the Buddhist temple uh -huh. in New York City. And we earned just enough money <laughs> for two one-way tickets to Los Angeles. And from there, they, they toured us from LA to Fresno to Stockton, Sacramento, San Francisco. Uh, and that was the beginning of becoming a sort of troubadour for the movement. Oh and we found that music was a powerful way of supporting and talking about ideas, uh, bringing people together and showing that um, our creativity there was so much creativity going on, filmmakers, you know, writers, poets, 
uh, this was a very uh, vibrant moment for the Asian American movement. The arts were really a huge driving force in creating a visual presence and, a, and a, an environment that was that showed who we were. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. It, it, so do you feel this is happening again today? Is there a resurgence, uh, would you say, of, of, of all this energy and, and the tragedies that are happening and the people speaking out? Oh, well, yes, and, and definitely. Um, this has been quite a year for us. Um, the pandemic, the blame, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. Uh, it, it's been a very stressful time. And then the violence that has broken out against uh, Asians on the street. I mean, we all know people who have been attacked either verbally or physically. Um, and so it's been a wake up call. If, if this is nothing new, mm -hmm. it just, the racism got stimulated by the leaders in this country mm -hmm. and uh, because of fear. It's a fear-driven you know, moment when white people feel that they're gonna lose their power. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, it, yes, uh, Tutor for Solidarity has, has been standing. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, anti-Asian hate uh, uh, activity and trying to come, you know, trying to connect with uh, other people of color. So I think that's really good and necessary. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of art is gonna come out of it. Mm. I'm sure a lot of art and a lot of conversation, a lot of meeting is happening, mm -hmm. <clears throat> especially amongst uh, elder generations and, and younger generations. Mm -hmm. The conversations are, are happening which is very necessary because I know in the beginning of the movement, we yeah. thought we discovered gold. Okay, mm -hmm. we've discovered the movement, you know, mm -hmm. but there were elders before us who, who had been uh, fighting for justice mm -hmm. from the earliest times that we've been here. And so it's nothing new. Yeah. Uh, and that we are connected to a tradition of resistance. Yeah, we really must take tribute to the past. And um, I'm wondering, is it, is it, uh, I mean, I imagine planning for an album is incredible. Like it takes years and years, I imagine. So is it a, how did you time this album with, with all the things that are going on? Are there <laughs> new songs that you just wrote yesterday? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Actually, um, the offer to do the album came in 2019. Oh. And uh, it's a double album, so some of the music comes from the very early album, A Grain of Sand, as, long, as, as well as a few other albums that I've done. So one uh, group of uh, a disc is that. And then there's a disc of new songs or newly interpreted yep. songs that I've done. Mm -hmm. So uh, both elements, and it came together fairly quickly, actually. I mean, I had songs that I'd written that I never recorded. And, um, and then just, you know, <laughs> the moment is here, you know, you start <laughs> thinking about what do I want to say. And, and so that I did write a few new songs that I that of the moment that I needed to get out. I see. And Black Lives Matter was going really strong. Mm -hmm. I had the help of making a, a music video into uh, from Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter actually came before these, this last couple of years. It came because my mother-in-law, my, my uh, mother-in-law who lived to be 111 years old, oh, yeah. Yeah. was born. I think you met her. Oh. She, she came to your opening oh. of, of the exhibit. Oh, uh, she, yeah. I, I believe she came. She was in the exhibit, actually. Uh, she had one of those little oh, altars. Yes, 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 yes. I think Karen Ishizuka made an altar of Mamie oh. Kirkland. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And Mamie was born in Mississippi and was a lynching survivor. Her father was threatened with a lynching. And at seven years old, the family had to flee overnight mm. from Mississippi. So her story, uh, 
my husband began following her story and said, we need to make a documentary about what happened to my mother, because she's also just an extraordinary storyteller and, a, and an amazing human being. So uh, we took her back to Mississippi 100 years, at 107 years old. She was 107. She just had her birthday. So we took her back to Mississippi, and that was 100 years from the time that she had left. And that turned out to be a most amazing trip because the father left with a friend. Mm -hmm. the, both of these men were threatened with a lynching. They, they left in the middle of the night, and then the mother in the morning left with the children. And the, the friend, John Hartfield, returned to Mississippi four years later and was lynched before a crowd of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. So when we went back to Ellisville, Mississippi, we stood in the very place that this man was lynched. And that really struck me, how much hate does it take to do this to another human being? To shoot him 2,000 times, to, to hang him, to shoot him, to burn his body, to cut off limbs, uh, and sell them as souvenirs. This is the kind of a hatred uh, that existed. And so this is where the song Black Lives Matter came from. And um, I, have a, I have a son who's African-American. So I, I was a single mother with a half Afro-Asian son. So that was also uh, one of the songs in the album reflect that experience. Um, and then, of course, you know, Gaman, uh, the, the traditions that kept us strong during camp, that helped us survive and, and thrive as a community. Uh, these are things that need to be remembered and talked about. Um, 120,000 Stories was inspired really by Tsuda for Solidarity because of what they did to go uh, at the border and tell their stories and support uh, border uh, refugees to try to support and to keep the children out of the camps mm -hmm. that we had once been in. So these are the stories that are in this, uh, as well as some Obon songs. Uh, uh, I, I write <clears throat> Obon music, uh, Japanese American Obon music mm -hmm. in English and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so some of those uh, pieces are also in the album. Great, what a rich tapestry of, of music. And, you know, I do want, I'm so curious about that documentary that you went with your mother-in-law, that you made with your mother-in-law. Is there a title that we can all- Yes, it's called 100 Years from Mississippi. Okay, okay. let's all look that It's up. going to be playing at the Harlem International Film Festival next month. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and so we're oh, gonna go. Yeah. That's so great. That's so wonderful. And I'm sure your album is gonna is gonna do just as great things <laughs> as that. Um, so I was wondering, uh, could you possibly tell the backstory, um, perhaps play a little bit of um, "Not Your Butterfly"? And okay. So this song, Not Your Butterfly, came as sort of a protest or a answer to a banner that I saw outside of, on La Brea Avenue, not far from my house, a bunch of banners that spoke of this opera at the Amundsen Theater, Not Your Butterfly. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> Madam Butterfly. Madam Butterfly, OK. So when I saw these banners of Madden Butterfly, I'm going, are they still doing this opera? This, this opera and this image of Asian women has been hounding us for over a hundred years, followed by, you know, the uh, world of Susie Wong, uh, Miss Saigon, you know, we've been living these, with these images of Asian women, mm -hmm. which do not reflect at all who we are. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I think I need to write my own little aria mm -hmm. <laughs> in modern day language and, uh, and speak to uh, 
what this is. And also, um, more than a decade ago, I went to Japan and I went to and met my family for the first time. And I found out that my great grandmother, who took care of my mother and her sister when they were sent, they were kibei, they were sent to Japan because it was really hard for my grandmother to take care of them here. And I found out she was from a samurai clan mm -hmm. and that there were so many stories of her and how powerful she was, how she made uh, uh, decisions for the family, how she, you know, she was really sort of the head. She was a matriarch of the family. Wow. And so that played in my head. And uh, I came up with these lyrics. Uh, I'm not your butterfly. I'm not your picture bride. I am a samurai woman who holds up half the sky. I have unbowed my head. I have unbound my feet. I have endured the heat. I'm not afraid to leap. <laughs> so that was my starting space. Yeah. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So this song, you know, then I, and I then I went into this space of okay, but it's also my story. Uh, and it's a story of women who have survived, uh, you know, the crossing. Yeah, well, my my grandmother was a picture bride, but I'm not a picture bride. They still have such things as picture brides, mm -hmm. you know, that that sell people basically Asian women today, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so anyway. Um, I went on with a song, say, uh, uh, I have crossed waters wide, I have climbed mountains high, I carried you inside my heart when I took a stride. I am your memory, stories of you and me, moment of breaking free so you can be, you can be, I am, I am. I wanted to claim who we are. I am, I am. Uh, I do not know my age, so there's ageism as well. I do not know my age. I am born every day. I am here to create. I am, I am here to create, I am. And that's what I feel as an artist. I feel that I'm here to create this sense of presence. Mm. The sense of, of of possibilities, as as an Asian woman, as an Asian American, as a human being, right. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. As a mother, I think, oh my God, <laughs> we have to remember all our mothers and sure. Absolutely, absolutely, and the, you know what happened in uh, uh, Georgia? Mm -hmm. How many days did we wait till we knew the names of these women? You know how. And what was the insinuation at the beginning of it that these were sex workers? Mm -hmm. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't, who knows? But that was the implication. And, and um, these were working women. These were working class women who were mothers and, and aunties and, and were trying to survive. And when I heard this, I was reading this one line this woman said, she said, it's so hard in America. Americans hate us. Mm. I mean, that broke my heart. Yeah. That broke my heart. I said, how can this be after all this time? So I, in a way, I'm, I'm, I wanted to start a campaign. <laughs> this song, the name of the song is not, a, not Your Butterfly. And I'm and not your butterfly, it sort of has an attitude to it, right? <laughs> And that's also the name of my book, which is coming out on UC wow. Press, which tells a more complete story of who I am and mm -hmm. the work that I do in community as a community artist. I consider myself a community artist okay. and organizer. Mm -hmm. I use music, I use dance, I use obon, I use, um, you know, theater to tell our stories. Um, so, 
yeah, it's time to tell us who we are right now. We have to stand up. And um, so I, I made, I'm making this T-shirt that says Natural Butterfly, and I want Asian women, Black women, all kinds of women to wear these T-shirts and take pictures of themselves and oh. post them. <laughs> Maybe you can help with this, Taiji. I would like to wear myself. <laughs> okay, okay. So the last verse of the final verse. Uh, I'm a grandmother. I'm a barefoot gardener. I am a lover, a healer. I'm a memory keeper. I am a dancer. I'm a freedom believer. I am a seeker, a cultural weaver. I am, I am. I am a woman who holds up half the sky. You are the women who hold up half the sky. We are the women who hold up half the sky. We are the women who hold up half the sky. We are the women. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is, that is so that, that, that last line, we were the women who hold up half the sky, actually comes the Red Book. Chairman Mao, I guess, in the early days of the movement uh, and the cultural revolution at the time, uh, raised up women and showed them that women hold up half the sky. That was a that was a saying that people had said, oh, and uh, I thought that was very apt at this moment. I see. Oh, that was so heroic, and <laughs> my, you sing about a new progressive archetype for all women inclusive of all women of color. And, you know, I, I, I'm not female, but the song makes me feel so proud of women. And I, my, you know, my humble feelings to you and the new age that you paint. And what will, what will women do on this earth as equals, as, as you say, hold up half the sky. Right. Such powerful words. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you. And um, <laughs> I, I, I want to, find out once more when is your book coming out uh june 15th of this on uc year? press yeah, oh. this year anything happy for you this year great yes. so let's all look for that and um hey everyone out there listen to this album that has a huge collection of songs like come on addressing the incarceration of japanese american in the camps run by the u.s government during world war ii and thank you also for your commitment to the group um, that you started in 1970 called Great Leap. Um, yes, oh. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about that. Yes, I've been running an arts organization mm -hmm. uh, since 1978. It oh. still survives okay. uh, after 42 years. Thank you. And uh, so in the book, uh, which, which is by UC Press, and you can get it through Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, you can read more about how I see arts and culture as a way of social change. Right. And, and the album, uh, you can look at the Smithsonian Folkways uh, website okay. and uh, you can download or, or Spotify, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. I want people to hear it. Uh, yes, let's yeah. get it out there. Oh, to share. So special, seriously, seriously. So can some people join uh, this, this group you called Great Leap? Is there a way to join uh, You can look on the website, greatleap.org, uh, okay. uh, and find out more what we're going to do with this campaign <laughs> of Not Your Butterfly. Oh, uh, wonderful. And I'll probably do it on Facebook. Okay. Uh, start in May, uh, Asian American Month, okay. and see where it, where it takes us, you know? It's a journey just like you, you know, you start a project and <laughs> you don't know exactly where it's going to take you, but it takes you. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. um, when you're hard in it, it does wonders. So thank you, Nobuko. That is, it's really touches me that I was able to talk to you today. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Good uh, to see you. <laughs> thank you.